Okay, uh, Kamavas, it's all yours. Okay, great. Um, let me start by sharing my screen. Hopefully this works. Okay, can I get a confirmation that you can see my screen? Yes, I see a, um, a, a GitHub page on Sassify. Yep, perfect. Um, so this is uh, the primary uh, location to track this project right now. It's Sassify under my team, MetaMask's uh, GitHub org. Um, and so right now it is a uh, experiment for the Browserify build system. It's specifically, it's a plugin because it has a Browserify has a plugin system um, for getting the the build that's output. Um, the, the input is a, a bunch of common JS stuff, um, and the output is a you know some small kernel, and then that that runs these all the modules inside of Ces containers. And so. Um, you know, the, the main goal here is to reduce the risk of supply chain attacks where, you know, third-party code is uh, modifying um, the behavior of your app in undesired ways. Um, and so there's three main things that we've identified here, which is uh, preventing modifying JavaScript's primitives and limiting access to the platform API. We do this part with CES. Um, and then we need to prevent the overriding of modules exports. Um, and so we've tried that in different ways previously um, before we were doing like a deep freeze on it um, But some modules expect to be able to late like modify their exports later um, for example like some lazily defined thing uh, We found that in one of our crypto libraries. They are They don't define a curve until you try to use it and so that was breaking uh, for, for frozen exports. Um, and so this is actually the, the part that is the least clear of what to do. And I wanna show what I'm working on right now and maybe um, if there's some existing prior art there, um, maybe get some advice. But I have a, a new project um, called Kowtow and that's under my personal name. Um, and there's not a lot of documentation for it, but uh, the idea is that it's a sort of a deep proxy, you know, a proxy returns a proxy over um, any child's on some object. Um, and then it is a shadow on write. So if you write to it, then you start seeing the, the thing that you wrote instead of the new thing. So the idea is here is when a module has defined its exports uh, and then you report, you import it via require statement on another module you get this deep proxy around whatever was returned. Um, so then if it's updated late afterwards by the original mo model <laughs> module definition, then that is, um, that's fine, you, you'll, you'll see the new thing. And I'm if sorry, you could, write- Could you go, could you, could you, I did, didn't quite, could you go through that again? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me see if I covered my notes here. No, I don't, didn't really. Um, so the, what we want to do is we want some defensibility for the module exports so that uh, so that something can't import it and then mutate it in a way that affects other modules. And in that way, like an attacker could move through the dependency graph by modifying someone else's modules and someone else's modules. And that's okay. Does that make sense so far? Yes. Um, so my initial approach was just to deep freeze after after module exports has been set. Um, and so that works pretty well, except some modules expect mutability of module exports. Um, and so they, the, you know, they had set some getters so that they can laz lazily set the property. And then instead of just returning like a cached value inside the getter, they were actually trying to redefine the value. So it didn't have that getter. So anyway, so just, just some sort of like lazy, um, late mutation of module exports, and that didn't that broke for us because um, uh, because we were doing deep freeze to do this protection. So now I want to do a like mutable freezing of sorts, or a mutable um, preventing of of mutation to the original. Um, so I'm starting this project called Kowtow, and it's cow from like copy on right, um, but <laughs> I guess. Shadow on right is more more appropriate to what we're doing here. Um, 
And so the idea here is that um, you take an object, any object, it could be a class definition or you know whatever, and you you put this proxy around it, and it's a deep proxy in the sense that if you try to get something off of it, and the result of that will also be wrapped in a proxy. Now, obviously, for some things like what numbers and booleans and strings, we don't wrap that in a proxy. We just return those as is. Um, just just a point of clarification. Yes. Uh, so, so can you contrast the behavior you're, you're seeking to that of uh, the read-only um, um, uh, semantics of uh, ES, um, you know, ES modules? Like when you import something that is a, a let, um, you know, export let whatever in the original model, uh, importing it in, in a new module that you cannot change that value, but the original module can. So are we about this kind of behavior or beyond that even? So that, that's a great question. And I'm fortunate I'm not going to answer it completely because um, Browserify only works with common JS style. And if you want to use, if you want to consume them, something that uses the import export statements, you have to first like transpile it into common JS. And so it's common for some people to use uh, you know, some like Babel transform that, that actually turns them all into requirement statements, which may or may not change the semantics. Um, so uh, uh, the only thing we're supporting here is common JS semantics. And I'm not as familiar with the module semantics to like properly answer your question. All right, no, that, that's actually a very good um, reply, Acton. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, one thing that's common uh, is that we'll see, especially like inside a package, some module um, exports something and then another, and you know, so some module imports that and then decorates it or something like that with other things and then exports that. Th that seems to be a common pattern. So it's important to be able to uh, mutate the thing that you actually get back from your require statement. Um, and so you know, one approach we did before was we would do like a shallow copy of everything. Um, you would do, uh, you know, tried shallow copies and deep copies and all these sorts of things. But um, and then I got stuck at when we had this like late, late updating of a, of exports. Um, so so now I'm trying to do this um, this uh, you know this like series of proxies. Um, and so then if you perform a write on them inside the proxy, it, it you know, records that write and it will give you back that, that written value instead of giving back the, the underlying value. So that's what I mean when I say sh the shadow on write. Okay. Uh, uh, Kamavis, are you aware of any of um, uh, Alex's work on membranes or, or, or the membrane work in general? Um, the, in, in like really vague hand wavy forms, yes, but not actual modules, and I haven't explored them. So I would really like to do that if you have some good recommendations. Okay, the, 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 yeah, the membrane work is kind of orthogonal to modules, but what, what you're, the, the kind of thing that you're doing very much reminds me of uh, one of Alex's uh, motivating use cases, uh, mm -hmm. which is um, uh, where you've got several pieces of code sharing, uh, virtually sharing DOM nodes, but DOM nodes are often decorated. Um, uh, you know, the DOM programmers often use the term expandos for this, where they, different modules will add different custom properties only for their use. Uh, and they're not intended to be shared state with other modules. Uh, and so uh, Alex's uh, membrane is able to basically uh, give each um, uh, uh, each compartment separated by the membrane, its own subjective view of the DOM node that has the properties that it added, but none of the properties that anybody else added. Is that the kind of decoration of module exports uh, in, on re-exporting? Is that, is that kind of what that's, you're seeing, that you've got that's decoration that's really just subjective? Yeah, that's potentially uh, exactly what I'm looking for. Um, the the main thing that I'm having trouble with is um, when you start doing things like the thing that I'm exporting is a class, 
And then, so now I want to use this, you know, proxy version of that class. And then I'm like extending that. Um, some things don't work right. I don't know, you get the wrong prototype or something like this. And I mean, that's a bug that needs to be solved. But um, it's maybe a more exotic case than a few of these like immutability libraries I've seen handle correctly. Um, so I'm curious how the, the membrane handles this. And if I could uh, get a repo name, that would be great. I'll post it in a moment. Yeah, well, I, I have to say that I'm worried that doing membranes by default on in Cessify at module boundary seems like a very, very large hammer um, that some, that's sometimes needed, but usually more, you know, uh, much is much more than is needed. Is, is yeah, uh, I, I'm I'm worried about some things like um, you know for using like uh, you know crypto libraries importing big number and big number is going you know if all these things are proxied something that's in some really hot path like uh, big number oh, yeah. might might be really really painful. Um, so what I'm hoping is that uh, so far I, I've you know made Cephalia a bit modular so that we can do. We have some options in the execution environment. We have some options in the defensibility um, so that maybe by default we just do a deep freeze on it and that's fine. Or maybe in some cases we do this proxy and that sort of thing. We could just like throw that in the config. Okay. Yeah. Um, having the, the deep freeze be the default and having to have something in the config to do something else uh, makes me a lot more comfortable. Yeah, makes sense. Um, okay, so sort of uh, we're, we're, in summary, what we have so far, like the Cessway internals are uh, using Cess for the execution environment, using Kato or some sort of membrane kind of thing for one of the defensibility of exports options. Um, and then Cessify has this little kernel, which is basically we're talking about the implementation of the require method. Um, uh, and then there's also uh, auto automatic generation of the, the configuration. The configuration we're talking about, like what modules are modules allowed to import, um, what platform APIs it gets, um, and this sort of thing. Um, and so that happens via some static analysis of the globals use. We're using um, some Acorn related tools for the static for the AST and analysis. Um, and then there's also this JSON configuration schema for what the configuration might look like. I can pull up an example. Yeah, by, by, by way of uh, connecting up with what um, Kamavas just showed us with things that have been covered previously in these meetings, um, so uh, the analysis that uh, Kamavis is doing, he, bi he built his own Tofu tool uh, that's um, uh, you know, similar in concept to what uh, Bradley did, uh, but done independently. And Bradley's thing generates JSON that's, other, that's different than the configuration um, file that, that we need for, for doing the least authority configuration of the modules. The idea was that we would write a converter from Bradley's format to ours for format, uh, whereas Kumavis's Tofu tool uh, generates the least authority configuration file directly. Yeah, um, I think mine is definitely more quickly thrown together and not as mature as his. His was looking at more how things were used. Are they only being read from or being they are they being written to? or um, his seemed to have a much more richer analysis, and I, I was just wondering whether or not that API like appeared in a module or not. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so what I have on the screen right now is a automatically generated config for uh, one of the MetaMask uh, browserify bundles, um, and MetaMask is quite large, uh, especially the UI side is has a lot. Um, but uh, let me. So we see something like this. Here is a module. It's called by name. We don't include the version information here. Um, so if there's multiple versions of this, excuse me, of this package, um, 
included, then they will get the same config. Um, the we have some potential configurations for different kinds of environments. For example, um, oh yeah, so I didn't mention it, but one of the main goals for this is that you can just take anything off of NPM and it should work okay, as opposed to like building things that are specific to this environment or have some specific configuration that explain what they need or how they work. We're just trying to make it basically things that worked previously be able to run in Cessify containers. So that includes, um, you know, well, if you're using the old style of functions and doing function.prototype to string, that doesn't work under Cessify um, or under Cess. So in those situations, we detect that usage and we su suggest a different environment for execution, such as maybe spinning up a iframe, um, you know, like a fresh realm just for instantiating that one module. Um, and, and then not reusing that realm. Obviously you run into the identity in, in continuity issue, but um, we don't see that too much, especially I feel like in the NPM ec ecosystem, you don't see that too much because people just, um, um, I don't know, they get, they stop using instance of, because if you got like instance of buffer was run package and, and I don't know. Anyways, I haven't seen that issue specifically too, too often. I'm not sure why, but, um, um, Anyway, so here, here is the, if you want to over the, the kind of environment. Mm -hmm. Quick question, which issue like uh, instance of uh, related to, um, like could you elaborate a bit? Oh yeah, so this is slightly tangential, but um, the using instance of in NPM can be tricky because if you end up, so let's say it's a big num, right? And something was passed to me and I want to do an instance of big num. It might not be the version of big num that I'm using. It might be a different version of big num that they're using. So instance of would fail in that case. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it kind of lost popularity in the NPM ecosystem for that sort of reason. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so then, yeah, so, he, so here we have a package. Here's a overwrite of the default execution environment in which it's defined. Uh, here's the modules it's allowed to, to import. Um, and then you could, I don't have it set up now, but you could replace the actual module it gets when it tries to import something. Um, yeah, do you have, and, do you have an example um, of that where you, do you, do you have an example of that where you um, are rewiring the, the modules to something else? No, because right now I'm only using the default configuration, um, okay. and we don't do anything like that in default configuration, though we could. Um, th so that this one okay. doesn't use any platform APIs. You know, obviously it uses JavaScript things, but it doesn't use any browser APIs. Whereas this one is using uh, quite a few browser APIs, um, uh -huh. and mm -hmm. by Good. default we we you know let them all in. Um, and then set timeout and clear timeout, I think, are here for historical reasons, just because like the old version of Sass I was using didn't allow them at all. Um, but yes, this gives you a basic picture of what's going on here. And then uh, mm -hmm. you can, you can, uh, we, we did, um, as part of the hackathon, we then took that the output of this config as well as some additional uh, dependency graph information and we were able to show um, that which packages have been given like high highly potentially dangerous um, platform apis very powerful platform apis so here we're looking at the dependency graph um, uh, of a single bundle of metamask um, and assuming we're operating under Cessify, what platform APIs could get um, access by each one. So for example, this one, this is this package called Web3, um, and we can see that it's running in an unfrozen environment and it has those globals exposed to it, XHR and some other things, um, and then just also the, the modules it can talk to. Um, but this one, so the coloring here is all, this is sort of like hand done, uh, not per module, but per um, global. So if we see it's doing network stuff, we'll go ahead and color it red as like a high, high alert. Um, 
This one has, what, what is it? Oh, I guess it just has globals exposed to it and therefore it's yellow. Um, and then the other ones are, are green. So they, it's not, doesn't have any uh, platform APIs exposed to it um, explicitly. Though of course, you know, the, the export of this could just be a small wrapper around the, the XHR. So this something, this thing could technically be getting almost direct access to the XHR. Um, so you really need to, um, you know, look around, look at the neighborhood around the these red ones. But the um, the the reason why this graph view is useful is because of you see those connections. We could also just you know like list all the modules in a spreadsheet, and you could see what they got. But it's important to see the connections here and understand that this one uh, might be linking its its access to crypto to this one. Um, quick question about the connections, though. They, they seem to be bidirectional. Um, uh, this is, yeah, that is a failure of this data visualization to not include an arrow on one of the sides. So it is technically directional. Uh, perfect. So about hovering tells you that missing detail, I guess, right? So. Uh, I guess it, it would, yeah, it, this is desperately missing those arrows. So, arrows. so this is Web3, and this one is CryptoJS. And I can see this crypto.js is not importing anything, so it must be the yeah. recipient of that one. The uh, the purple is the the root here. That's the entry point. Perfect. Ah, ah, okay. And um, just to to emphasize your point about the connectivity, uh, if there's um, any time you have a uh, something green importing something red, uh, that's also a um, a place where uh, the programmer might want to manually interpose an attenuator uh, yes. so that the green thing only has access to the subset of the red power that that green thing really needs. Yeah, and, and you might also want to investigate if you need that red thing anyways, or like why is that, you know, if it's a string yeah. format, or why does it need access to the network at all? Uh, um, red if, it, if it imports red? Maybe, maybe you, you want to... Um, I think you would technically end up with everything red doing that if it if you recursively followed that rule anyways yeah um, well, well but you can at least yeah. color it yellow or something like this um, or or we could maybe build some more static analysis tools here but um, the the main point here is that if you're not running this in Cessify, everything is definitely red because anything can really <laughs> yeah. pull any platform API so it, it lets you sort of uh, start prioritizing what uh, what to audit and are we see so are we seeing here the um is, is each circle a module or is each circle a package each circle is a package and we define uh the configuration per package um because one they have the same publisher so it's not like it's unlikely that right. you know it's going to be partially compromised or something like that um and then that just gives us a major de bloat in the in the configuration, um, in in this visualization, you can you can view it as modules, but it's also a lot of noise, and I don't know, it doesn't fit in the screen right now. So you have a particularly large um, NC graph. This is per modules. What is, what is purple? Purple is the app, the top level app in this case. Uh, so but, presumably, your your own code is not dangerous, right? But it, one, one could argue <laughs> that the granule uh, uh, manifest that we're talking about applies inside the package, and this applies cross packaging. So, if you know you have the right versions of packages that enforce the right authorities inside them, then no, the the the, the, the manifest we're talking about is is the app constraining the connectivity among the packages. Uh, assuming that you only use packages that you know each package is um, enforcing whatever it needs within it to prevent accidental um, you know um, authority being exposed um, somehow within the package itself well if whatever you grant to the package as a whole yeah. um, the uh, we treat the package as a, as a you know we treat a package authored by somebody else as a black box yeah. So whatever authority we give to the package as a whole, um, it might be promiscuously leaking that authority within the package among the modules within the package, but it still can't um, uh, get, you know, hopefully uh, can't 
yeah. get more authority than we've given to the package as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. So this is included for I don't know for fun or for for discussion, <laughs> but it's it's not really more informative than looking at the the packages view because that's where the how permissions mm -hmm. are. To, Um, so yeah, that's been some of my work on, on Sassify so far. This is great. Um, there, so I'd also, you know, obviously it needs to, uh, it needs a lot of audits. It needs a lot of documentation. It needs a lot of, um, work to really get it, get it going. And, and as a Browserify plugin, that's useful for, for some teams, but most people have moved to Webpack these days. Um, so it would be very appropriate to also make a Webpack version of this. I think there would be um, little, uh, you know, little specific code for how to get into each plugin. It should be pretty so reusable. Issue of, yeah, so this issue about what the boundary around uh, the module looks like at the uh, import export boundary, uh, whether you're doing a deep freeze or, and you know, whether there's, uh, it's a different root realm, uh, whether you're doing a membrane, uh, all of those are, are interesting knobs to turn. Yeah. We've been yeah. generally assuming in, in, in thinking about, um, uh, you know, a disciplined or a chosen subset of old code. Uh, together with uh, new code, um, uh, we've generally been thinking in terms of uh, the deep freeze at the boundaries and the different packages being different compartments within one root realm. Um, uh, and obviously that'll break some old packages, um, uh, but, um, uh, you know, the the assumption that that I've been making for uh, what we're you know what we're doing uh, at Agoric is that um, uh, we're willing to break we're willing to impose rules that uh, some old packages won't be able to live under and only accepting packages that do live under the rules that we define. Um, uh, how much of the functionality of what you're using um, uh, uh, if you imp if you did not create separate root realms and you did not impose the proxy or the membrane for doing the um, the decoration, um, uh, that would as you said that would break some of your some of the packages you're using. Uh, how, how much of a burden would that be? How hard would it be to recover from breaking those? Uh, and needing, needing to either fix or replace them so that it lives under the new rules? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think one, uh, one thing is whether or not you have good tools to patch deep dependencies. Like if it's, you know, A requires B requires C requires D and there's a problem in D, if you don't have a good way of replacing D without replacing that like whole dependency chain, um, then you're not in a good situation and that becomes a problem and you gotta go like knock on the door of repos that haven't been updated in years um, for your weird use case. Um, so um, that's, I would say that's one hard requirement. Um, Cause I had, you know, some random, there's some random things. It was like a polyfill for something that has really good adoption now, but it also accidentally modified the, the platform API. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's and then there's like a secp two fifty six k one the the crypto that we use that one is doing that late instantiation and that one is uh, very key uh, probably doesn't have a lot of replacements um, and you also don't want to like choose alternatives willy nilly um, because it's a crypto library um, and so. That one's a little trickier to deal with. I mean, I could monkey patch it and like get it to define itself before it exports. 
and then we probably wouldn't encounter that lazy issue. Um, but uh, sure, I don't want to do that if I can avoid it. Code, right? So until you have to monkey patch it again and hope that whatever they introduce can be mon monkey patched and not just leave you hanging with, you know, two versions right. or something. Okay. And in, in terms uh, of, uh, like, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I see Bradley joined us. So I just want to make, uh, I want to in particular uh, make this connection. Um, uh, Bradley is, is the person I was mentioning um, uh, uh, that did the uh, other tofu tool. Um, so uh, Bradley, uh, Kumavis did a uh, tofu tool uh, for uh, Sessify, which he's been showing us. Uh, it's, uh, he describes it as, as you know, uh, uh, much more of, uh, you didn't reuse the word ad hoc. I don't remember what word you used, but. Yeah, um, yeah I don't remember. Very uh, naive, quick and dirty. Quick, okay, but, but um, uh, what he's doing is he's directly generating the configuration file that he then uses to drive the uh, least authority linking. Uh, through uh, CES among the, among the packages. Um, so in any case, I just wanted, I want to make sure to introduce you guys, put you guys in contact, because it would be uh, great to, um, uh, you know, get a, a really great tofu tool that does generate the configuration that we need for least authority linkage. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you, your work was definitely doing a much better job of like looking in the context and seeing how the platform API was being used, and I'm just checking for presence. Uh, though I did do, I did do some, let's see if I can find an example. I did do some sort of like deep things. So like here it's, it's console.log, yeah. not giving the whole of console, it's giving console.log, and you know, I just implemented that in an arbitrary way, so sometimes it gets kind of crazy, or so it's like this, that, that, this, that, that, but um, Crypto, let's see, let's see, that's not too bad, but um, but like uh, yeah, I feel I, I, pretty good giving it a decrypt thing without giving it access to like pulling out the keys that are stored yeah. under the crypto API. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from the little looking that we've done, I think that this um, uh, uh, capturing the 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 dotted naming path uh, in the configuration in the output of the tofu uh, is really very good. Um, uh, and that some of the things that in our little experiment we had done by manually writing uh, attenuators uh, for uh, when the, some of the attenuators that we manually wrote, really the only thing they're doing is they're filtering down a, a tree of naming records to the uh, subset of the uh, naming paths that are being used. And uh, if we can just automatically generate that attenuation uh, from uh, the configuration file, rather than manually writing uh, attenuating modules, I think I think it would be very good for all of the really simple cases of attenuators that can be derived from the tofu information uh, to just be driven declaratively from the configuration file, and then uh, the programmer would still write manual attenuators uh, when there's some case that exceeds uh, what we can capture declaratively, um, and you know that would still be fairly common, but but it should still but it, it'll, it'll be much less common than the ones that we can capture declaratively. Yeah, I would also add um, the uh, the visualization, the graph visualization that you're using, um, which I. <laughs> You just, you, you, I don't know how much of this is off the shelf, just standard graph visualization stuff, and how much is it custom work that you did. But um, I would not uh, underestimate the value of this as a um, uh, social engineering tool um, for <laughs> for promoting. You know, to, as as something that somebody can you know uh, see a visualization of this like this of their own stuff, and you know it, it it invites them to say, oh, there's this one little red blob over here. Well, if I fiddle with my code in this way, you know, I can make it turn green. Um, and the thing which is really encouraging about this graph now, I don't know how representative this is of typical systems, is. Uh, how much of it is 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 green? 
um, and it kind of says, yeah. "Oh no, this is not a hopeless, uh, you know, this is not a hopeless security uh, 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 whack-a-mole game." Actually, we can we can now think about the problem as being bounded and as something that is amenable to a divide and conquer kind of uh, approach. And particularly when you've got a a community process uh, like the, the you know the open source world uh, beating on something, um, uh, this is this is should be tremendously helpful in driving things towards the kind of uh, end state we like. I would also add that uh, I would add this, ideally add a switch, which is not using CES. And you yeah. turn it off, of course, everything turns red. Yeah, I think that would be powerful. So, so um, yeah, the, pretty much everything here is, is fairly off the shelf. Um, this, I mean, it's from my module, but there's other ones out there that do this just, just as well. Um, and, and so I do, I think the best thing to do would be to make another Browserify plugin while we're still in the Browserify ecosystem. Um, make another Browserify plugin that just spits out this visualization. Um, the, the Doing it as a service is a cool idea, and you can kind of do that for packages. But um, if you want, it's, this is not really built for packages so much. This is built for apps. And then apps don't necessarily have a standard way that they, um, you know, engage their build system or um, set their Browserify configuration. Um, so it might uh, not work, or it might. I, I haven't looked at automating that. That would be interesting. Just like pointing it at a repo and, and generating a visualization. Yeah, I think that um, in terms of this uh, social engineering uh, aspect of this, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fantasizing about uh, just a website people can go at, go to and type in the name of an arbitrary uh, NPM package and then see this visualization um, or a visualization like this of the NPM package and just having that feedback. And there will certainly be screaming about how it's not, you know, a, a somewhat justified screaming about how it's not representative of risk in this way and that way, but this is sort of the general issue with benchmarking is that you can't create a single benchmark that's properly representative. All you can do is create a suite that fails in different ways so they fill in each other's blind spots. And this is a first um, such a benchmark for, for uh, measuring risk and calling attention to the places that should be reviewed first because they're the most risky points. Uh, it's got, um, you know, it's got enough truth to it to, to certainly justify it as a, as one good first approximation. And uh, the answer to objections to it should be, okay, do a different um, way of measuring it that fails in, in complementary ways and post that. Um, but yep. it's certainly better to to see something that's a good first approximation than continuing to operate blind. Yep, I agree. Uh, I'm I'm curious how, what the automation of, of this is going to be like, like walking package resolu resolutions against npm's API or something. But um, I'm sure there's some tools for it already. But I agree. I think it'll be very powerful. You know, that's that's one of those things that'll just like trend on Hacker News and Twitter and stuff, and and it'll bring a lot of eyes to to specify. Um, can I just add one small um, uh, important disclaimer to include with this because it is a very very powerful and convenient way to um, see a picture that is not very easy to paint in one's mind. Of, of your uh, security and to actually promote that you are like you you indulge in very very safe uh, packages uh, when you build your own products but um, it being used uh, without a disclaimer saying that this is just one representation um, you know it doesn't give you all the details it doesn't um, um, you know say that okay you you don't have to do the hard work too um, can can you know not be which is not misleading to those who understand that, can still be misleading to those who find it very convenient um, that they forget to actually ask, is this sufficient? Do I need to do more work? Or is that the whole like 
uh, answer. And if I just put this um, on my website, people will come to me and, you know, being very popular, very safe. Um, so just the false or the, the misleading uh, sense of this being the complete picture um, um, and can backfire if not handled responsibly. Yep. Yeah, that's a great point. Tests will make you rich, attractive, and secure. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think that's a valid concern, but, but given the, the extent to which um, uh, they're already, you know, the world's already overrun with, with uh, oversimplifications that are, that are just outright bullshit and which are uh, <laughs> more or less heavily relied upon, I think, um, uh, I think something which, which gives a, a, a picture which, which, which creates a, 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 you know, a sort of a Darwinian gradient that pushes people in the right direction, um, even if it is an oversimplification, is still a, a net benefit by a, a large margin. Yeah, and that's why mm -hmm. I just recommended the, the visible disclaimer in the visual to say that do your own work too. Uh, whatever how nice polite this needs to be, but it just has to be part of the visual thing to let people feel that they need, you know, to know that this is not, you know, in place of reality, it's a visualization. Um, but, you know, in order for us to actually overcome the uh, conveniences of a uh, false sense of truth, I think that visualization would just be a great picture. Yeah, I mean, there is, there is one way that, that uh, I mean, there's a lot of ways in which this as a first approximation is really quite good. And there's a lot of ways in which you can say uh, that this really does show something that's a genuine true constraint, which is uh, the ability to affect the outside world can only enter this graph through nodes that are not green. Uh, and the further influence on the outside world can come from green nodes, but only through the explicit connections. Uh, so there's both the, uh, the fact that the connection to the outside world is indicated by color, and then the further influence among modules uh, has to be bootstrapped over off of the initial connectivity. Um, you know, the eventual connectivity has to be bootstrapped off of initial connectivity. Um, so, uh, you know, the basic object capability rule of, of only connectivity begets connectivity. Uh, this visualization really does state an important truth that's better than a first approximation um, uh, in terms of understanding the limits on vulnerability that are implied by the graph. Uh, so far, um, I've been primarily working on this by myself, besides obviously pulling in the great work of Seth and being able to, you know, nag Mark Miller now and then about various things. Um, and then, you know, inspiration, inspiration from like the tofu work and um, likely this membrane work once I get my eyes on it. Um, but in terms of you know, obviously auditing and, and documentation and flashy data visualization as a service and all these things. Um, I'm, I'm definitely going to need some help doing those things. <laughs> so, so the best way to do that. There is a company uh, that started up that might be good to at least talk to. Um, they've had some contact recently with the node security working group. Uh, they call themselves Return to Corp. They're at r2c.dev. Um, it's a little bit interesting, um, but they have an interface for writing things that crawl MPM itself and do yeah. analysis. No, oh, cool. And they can generate tables at least already for results. Um, so you can basically make things that uh, mark uh, typings and 
they do have a JavaScript permissions analyzer already that we've hmm. talked to them about. So um, nice. It might be good to at least talk to them. Or I Are you thinking in, in object capability or SES terms? Uh, they're not necessarily doing that. What they've been doing is more around type safety. Uh, we were talking, oh. what was it, this week? Yeah, this week I had a call with them about um, at least what Node is doing to create policies and kind of the constraints that we're applying to these APIs and multiple views in an object capabilities manner. Um, they seemed interested and have just a very similar tool set going on. And so I'm currently uh, rewriting some stuff to run on their platform to see how it works. And we're gonna see how it goes from that point on. Um, since they do allow you to write your own analysis tools, it's basically anything you can run within a Docker container they can try to create output for as long as you match their schema. So cool. if you want visualizations added to that, it might be good to talk to them. Um, they're a fairly small team of people though, so if you're going to do stuff with them, you're gonna have to write it yourself like I'm doing currently. <laughs> Yep. Uh, yeah, no, but just having access to um, a nice API for reading an NPM data would be, would be cool. Um, yeah, that, that data viz just runs off of a big JSON blob. So um, in that sense, it's pretty modular. Yeah. Did you write the graph visualizer? I did write this one, though you can find other ones that just run in React just fine. I got um, uh, by really way on, on some of the use UX stuff and, and that sort of thing. So I ended up writing my own, but yeah. Okay. Very, very cool. Now, ironically, I recall it has problems with CES, with the actual CES repositories, because of course they're doing meta level cheating in order to make it all work, right? Uh, what? Analyzing the CES or what? Yeah. Analyzing CES, yes. I don't think I ever tried that. Oh, okay. I thought we did that, tried that in, in uh, Berlin. No, I don't, I don't think I did. And I don't remember CES having a lot of dependencies anyways. Besides, it just has like the one Unless that changed, I don't know. But no, I don't think I tried that. Okay. Or maybe it was, we tried it on uh, uh, Cosmos, on our, on our swing set, rather. <laughs> that so makes is it more sense. running yeah. somewhere? How do, I, how do I arrange to run this? Is there anything special I need to do to be able to run this? I really would like to be able to do the same uh, thing. Yeah, so I have one module that will dump the, uh, no, it's like way too involved. I need to make that easier. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm going to I'm going to be giving a talk on uh, the 15th this Monday, um, and I'm probably going to um, uh, just borrow some some of these graphics to uh, just you know uh, briefly make a point about uh, uh, least authority linking of modules under SES. Yep, you're more than welcome to. Is there a uh, Mark? Do you have a video? Or is that useful, or do you just is picture sufficient? Um, uh, having having a um, an animation would certainly be flashier. Uh, I would like that. This one is slightly interactive in that you can like get a little bit of a heads up display on what it is and what it's importing and that sort of thing. Is that is that yeah. live? If, if, yeah, yeah, on it, GitHub it, pages. Yeah. So. Okay, yeah, if, if I can do it live where I can, you know, mouse over it myself, that's even better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, we're fine. Okay, so yeah, so if, after the call ends, if you could just send me email with the information I know to run it live, that would be wonderful. Yep. I did, I did one more for, what was it? What was it called, Tendermint? Yes, Tendermint.js. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, that might be what Dean's remembering. Dean, is that Paul? Is that uh, no, 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 we played at the swing set first. I and, tried it on swing okay. set. I don't remember what the issue was. It has a bundle and you know a file that has because because it's use, it's got its own roll up layer because it's using SES. That was an obstacle. So T Tenderman JS was fine. Oh, you know, you're you're not using Browserify. I think that was the main issue. Oh, right, that too. Okay. Okay. So this, yeah, you know, here you see it with a much tinier project. Yeah, so so one of the things that, um, you know, for our purposes, we want to keep our eye on going forward uh, is, um, uh, you know, we're working on um, uh, SES support for uh, ECMAScript standard modules and uh, doing uh, uh, packaging of that that's very careful to preserve the semantics and the yeah. security properties. I imagine I'll encounter that in Webpack, though I'm not sure how Webpack actually handles them. Yeah, we, we don't, one of the things that I've gotten the sense of from all the existing packagers is that none of them carefully document what their transformation is. And in particular, they don't carefully document what their transformation is guaranteed not to be in the future. So there's no strong sense in which we can be confident that the packagers are preserving the semantics that our security depends on. I think um, generally their, their notion of semantics preserving is functionality rather than uh, security. It's about what does happen, not about guarantees and what does not happen. Yeah, in order to document something, I think there needs to be a, something to document. And I, I think they'll think it's so much that they haven't documented these things just they haven't, you know, it's sort of just not part of their, their universe of discourse. Uh, it's yep. like Coca-Cola recipe, right? There's no patent. <laughs> uh, it, it, Coca-Cola is much more consciously secret. I think this is more um, simply lack lack of demand uh, by most of the rest of their customers um, uh, to know precisely what the what the transformation is, as long as it preserves functionality. Uh, pre but, perpetually preser preserves functionality, I think, is the key word at the moment. That, 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 that is the magic that, you know, if they describe, you know, everybody else would uh, do better. So. Well, and then with also by having a system with plugins, you also maybe don't have those guarantees as soon as you include a plugin. Like with, with Browserify, I'm taking their like, their kernel, like their finalization process where they take all the individual modules and slap them together with this kernel and I'm throwing it out and putting in my own thing that does it in a very different way. And so, you know, maybe how much can they actually guarantee these things is another problem. But yeah, I'll see what I can find when I dig into Webpack. Um, just that quick question. Uh, have you considered, um, using, um, you know, uh, ECMAScript modules as one option, like going from ECMAScript modules to ECMAScript modules that are just bundles of the module, like, like kind of like Rollup does, um, um, but, but, you know, um, without needing to shim the actual module or, or um, transpile to CommonJS at any point. Uh, I've not uh, really considered that. I think primarily just because Browserify is already tooled around only supporting common JS modules. And so that's kind of the norm there. As we move to Webpack, I expect that to not be the norm. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of just putting off caring about ECMAScript modules. <laughs> but yeah, that's going to be something I need to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not a lot of surprises. Like, no, actually, there are a lot, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I, um, I need to go, but uh, keep keep the recording going, and uh, sometime when I have more time, I'll be able to catch up. Um, 
and I will talk to you all about uh, later. I, I've, yeah. Can I give 40, 40 more seconds of your time? I want to look at something really quick. Um, sure. It was, it was suggested that um, that I was maybe doing Cess wrong. So I create a root realm, and then I just always realm dot evaluate in it with um, I think realm. yeah I always just uh, initialize modules inside of that root realm. Uh, what does that mean in terms of containers? Is this a single container? He's not so, using the um, part, is the question. Yeah. Yeah. So the um, uh, so what ha we have within a root realm, we have the ability to create multiple compartments, and the distinction is that um, uh, different compartments have their own distinct global scope and global object, and therefore their own distinct evaluators for evaluating in that global scope. Uh, uh, if the uh, things that you're linking together that need to coexist within one root realm um, don't need distinct uh, global variables, um, uh, then uh, just doing a realm evaluate is fine um, to, uh, to, to bring them, to cause them to coexist in just directly in the root realm. However, uh, for uh, authority uh, aware code for the browser, I imagine that they are using global variables and that your uh, analysis, um, uh, uh, the uh, configuration file probably is identifying uh, global variables that different packages are assuming. Is that correct? Well, um, yeah, I'm not doing... I'm doing platform APIs, and then I'm ignoring other globals, which is maybe um, a mistake. I found a lot of modules that accidentally set globals, like uh, particularly bad is in for statements. People don't like put a let before their index. They just do index equals zero. <laughs> I that a lot. So <laughs> I, I just kind of started ignoring those um, and just only really? grabbed platform APIs from a list of platform APIs. Um, okay, so the, so, the plat so so let's talk about the platform APIs because this is where this comes up. Uh, let's say that you've got uh, package X that uses document and package Y that does not use document. Uh, but uh, X and Y um, uh, really should just be linked together within the same root realm so that there's no identity discontinuity between them. And in, and in general, compartments are much, much, much lighter weight than root realms. So if there's no so, reason so, why well, they would need to be in separate root realms, they should, they should yeah. be in just separate compartments. But in order to give one a global object that has document on it and give the other one a global object that, that does not have document on it, uh, the natural way to do that would be separate compartments. So when I do a dot evaluate, that is like the single default Con uh, compartment inside the root realm. So if you're doing a so so each realm instance object has its own dot evaluate. So when mm. you create a root realm, you get a realm instance object, and uh, doing a dot evaluate on that does it evaluates it directly in the root realm, like in the global scope that comes with the root realm. Uh, mm. Within the root realm, if you do a uh, capital realm, uh, you know, the realm class, capital realm yeah. dot make compartment. If you're already in a CES root realm, then just realm dot make compartment will make a safe compartment within the SES root realm. Uh, and then that'll also give you back a realm instance. And the realm instance has the same API. Uh, so it has the same evaluate, but the, but the evaluate on a realm instance that represents a compartment uh, we'll just use the global scope of that compartment but share all the primordials uh, from the root realm that it's within. Okay, I think I understand. But um, the, so it sounds like the main difference between running in realm.evaluate and running in a realm's uh, container is the global reference? 
However, in, in my case, third-party code is always wrapped in a function, um, and so it never okay. gets a reference to the global anyways. Okay, so for, um, uh, so if all of the variables that are free in the source code, that are, that are variables that are mentioned in the source code and assumed to be defined outside the source code, if all of those variables come into scope by virtue of the function that you're wrapping around it, and then the thing that you're realm evaluating uh, is only that containing function, uh, then you're cool. Uh, then uh, you're not introducing, you're not using a global object and a global scope as far as ECMAScript is concerned in order to introduce um, uh, the authority that that source code is assuming is defined in the scope that it's running in. You're, you're providing it through the module, per, through, through the function parameter. So that's cool. In that case, you do not need compartments. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I just have a single realm right now. Um, though, probably as a configuration option, you'll be able to run in an unfrozen realm that only you get in order to like handle the two string stuff. But we'll see. Uh, anyways, thank you yeah, very much. For yeah, for, for, yeah, for code that assumes that the primordials are mutable, giving them their own separate mutable root realm so that they only foul their own nest. Uh, uh, that, that's good. I mean, it does, does give you the, the, the potential issue of identity discontinuity, which you're aware of already. Uh, and it sounds like you've already uh, empirically found it just not to be as much of a problem as I would have expected. Um, uh, I, I guess there's some other things where, like, um, you know, if those objects that are you have on there, that on your exports, I mean, then they still are going to expose, like, you know, basically the function constructor, and then you could eval in their realm or something. So maybe we'd want to, like, freeze after evaluation, like, let them define no, their if, stuff. If, 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 the, if, the, if the realm that you're making is a uh, SES root realm, uh, you, you know, just, you know, for the ones that, that need to modify the primordials, you should still go ahead and make an SES realm. You just don't freeze it. Um, oh. the, uh, or actually, and it might even work just to make a, well, there's, there's a bunch of safety things that we do uh, on top of realm that SES does, which you probably still need. But in any case, one of the things, even at the realm level, even ignoring the SES level, uh, is we already make it the case that the function constructor that you can obtain by navigation uh, doesn't do anything. When I say uh -huh. obtain by navigation, what I, what I mean is uh, from any function, uh, it inherits from the function.prototype. That function.prototype has a constructor property that constructor property leads to something that is assumed to be a function constructor. Uh, so that's the function constructor you can obtain by navigation. Right. And inside uh, the, uh, anything that's created using the realm shim, uh, that function constructor, uh, uh, when invoked, simply always throws an error. It, it, that one will never evaluate anything. Uh, separately, on each global object, the global object that comes with the root realm as well as the global object that comes with each compartment, uh, each one of those has its own function constructor uh, that, it, that still constrains the code to SES rules. So none of this allows you to escape SES constraints, uh, but each of those function constructors uh, does um, uh, uh, create a function object that uh, will execute the code that you gave it uh, and will evaluate that code in the global scope that that function constructor is associated with. And likewise, uh, each global object, uh, both for the root realm and for the compartment, has its own eval function that does likewise. Yeah, right. Okay. So it should be the case that 
um, as you give, as you know, as as modules defined in different root realms, um, uh, as well as different compartments within the same root realm. In both cases, as long as all of it's running under the F, the uh, realm shin, um, uh, or better, the SES shin. In either case, uh, as they export and import things to each other, uh, as long as they don't export the function constructor directly or the eval function directly or the global object directly, uh, it should be impossible to obtain them by navigation from, from something that was innocently exported. And if there's any violation of that, you should uh, you, uh, that should definitely be reported to us because that would be a um, a severe hazard. Okay. Okay, uh, makes sense for me. Thank you, Markham. Okay. Okay, so I'm I'm going to uh, take off now, um, um, and I will uh, catch up with this uh, at some later time. Thanks. When do you get into Seattle, if you don't mind sharing that? I guess this is recorded. <laughs> going to, right, so I'm going to be at the full ECMAScript meeting. Uh, I'll, I'm currently scheduled to come in on the Monday before the meeting. Um, but uh, there's other potential meetings that we might have in Seattle that might cause me to come into town earlier or to leave later. Uh, the, that hasn't been determined yet, but I'll at least be there for uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Okay, great. Uh, I'll, I'll be here for the next three weeks, so um, it would be nice to meet in person again before the meetings. Great, great. Okay. Be yeah. seeing you. Thanks again. Uh, okay, uh, so I don't know if anyone has any more questions for me. Um, I think I already took a lot of this meeting's time to present that work. Um, so that's all I needed. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing that. And uh, of course. you got uh, useful info from the, from, for, you know, get some, got some questions answered as well. So. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, cheers. So. Other stuff going on. Uh, I did end up opening that PR I talked about before I left for leave. A uh, note about data URLs. I don't know if anybody cares, but data URLs in particular are forgeable and shared across all sorts of things according to their scheme. So if you care about it or have concerns, let me know. In particular, you can roughly use them to create a uh, global state. Sorry, Brad, I had one quick question. Um, um, like, I'm, I'm still going to close the loop about um, uh, mine and everything um, uh, on the PR, but uh, is the intent of it to just be used to import modules, ESM, or import any kind of um, um, mine uh, loaded? Type of module. Uh, this one allows you to support all the loaded types that are reasonable. Um, you can import JSON and WASM with the same level of support as any other import statement. And is there a, a limit, uh, character-wise, on what you're allowed to import? Not, not, not in terms of just being a string of a particular limit, but rather a memory limit. Um, for optimization purposes? Uh, I don't know what you mean by optimization purposes. I could imagine a denial of service, but current browsers don't implement those limits except for Opera. Okay, so there aren't any technical, okay, we're only going to allow that much in the data URL for no specific thing, right? There isn't that constraint anyway. Correct. The only environment that has that constraint to my knowledge so far that I've seen is Opera. Okay. The last thing is I think it does not allow require. 
require from data URL, does it? No, the require system is fairly closely tied to its cache and also to being on the file system. It just doesn't make sense there. We yeah. do have a MIME for CommonJS. We have not included it. We also have a MIME for C++ modules. Those are also not included yeah. in this because for uh, C++ modules, much like CJS, they expect to be run on a file. There's an operating system call to load them called DL open, which does not work out of memory directly. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I, that bit I saw. So, so we're talking here about uh, pre-compiled uh, dialects, basically. Oh, like, uh, they could be, yeah. Yeah, n not, not like uh, on-demand compiled. Um, in theory, you could, as long, because these are just strings. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I was talking about the C++ case that is here. So, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. So, um, I don't know how people feel about there essentially being a global storage space due to just how data URLs work. Um, Doesn't seem good, but I haven't looked at the details. There's a super large variety of ways for me to create global storage from ESM. So I don't know. Um, it when does you say from about, ESM, do you mean from the ESM shim implementation or from the ESM design semantics? Uh, from design semantics, that little bit about item potency means I can essentially pin stuff in place. And since I can do that, I can start to share it. And since I can share it, it can basically never die because of how the ESM loader semantics worked and we ended up having to tie the idea of the lifetime of a module to a realm. So basically any ESM module you create is effectively a permanent global under the current semantics. It's just how you can access that is varied. Um, would anybody like me to go into Infix Bang a bit? Uh, I know that this meeting so far has been super technical, and uh, maybe people are getting tired. But I would love to hear about Infix Bang. I would totally love to. Hear. Okay. How do people feel? But this has been something that I have been chomping at the bit for and done various false start attempts <laughs> years and years and years. Okay, let's see what I can show here. Um, I can also bring up the, uh, the, the, the demo running where you can see it in the command line tool. Uh, let's see where this is. Desktop two. I think this is it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so this is the Babel REPL for a PR that I have against Babel right now. Uh, and on the left-hand side here, I'll, I'll post the link as well to the meeting. That might be useful. Um, let's see where we are. Participants. Um, well, that's a lot of stuff. That's not what I wanted to post. The link works, but it's a lot of stuff right now. Um, so the main thing about Infix Bang is that we want to be able to run asynchronous operations on promises that is more than just pulling out the value with a then clause or getting the results of a re rejection with the 
<laughs> with a catch or a final. Um, so the infix bang syntax is essentially a combination between dot and pipe. So you can say with this one on line number one, after the promise x resolves, run the function p with arguments x, y, z, x, z, and q on the result. Um, so the translation on the right hand side, uh, for all of infix bang, we first promise resolve dot resolve x. So this works for anything that is not a promise as well. And then we run dot post, we're actually sending a function call to it. Um, and this all depends on the extended promise semantics, where uh, a regular promise object is augmented with prototype methods for post and get and put and delete and stuff like that. Um, it feels a little like you're starting in the middle here. Our, our primary goal is being able to do asynchronous message sent on promises. Yes. So in the middle, infix bang is basically just a way of making that more convenient. Uh, so the, the main part of the design was um, settling on which prototype methods we're having on the promises to implement the various things we can do with it. And the rest analogy is fairly straightforward, that a function call is analogous to a post with arguments. Um, a reference is analogous to a get, and an assignment is a put, and a delete is a delete. Uh, so that's what the syntax looks like. Um, behind the scenes, this is handled in much the same way that it would be synchronously, unless you make a so-called handled promise. And the handle promise has hooks that it can implement to trap these things. So I'll show, uh, I'd rather be guided by what the questions are, first of all. So um, where do I need to go next? So I'm most interested in the new way handled promises work. Since that's the main thing, handle promise is basically you have a is for when you want a promise that is acting as a remote reference for something. Uh, I want to be able to write how that remoting happens, and so that's the handler, right? Yes. And it's not even necessarily for things that are remote. You can also use it as Mark said, analogous to a proxy for handling local data if you want to add these methods to it. Um, I'll just pull up here. And we are, of course, using this, using this by the way, in our content. Yes. But, we, but the version I'm familiar with is a different implementation approach, so. Yeah. Uh, where do I have it? Test and test. Yeah, here we go. Uh, so, a handled promise looks like this. Um, it's called a relay right now. It used to be called relays, but we changed the name to handlers. So, essentially, you can make a handled promise and it gets a resolve and reject first argument executor. And you can say you resolve to uh, an object that is mapped to a given handler. So, the relay is there. So when this promise is resolved, it returns whatever you mapped to the first argument, just like a regular promise would. Um, what makes it special is that, oh, I wish I could show you some actual syntax, but this is just the, at the extended promise semantics. Uh, Okay, so well, I can bring up my, my demo if that's what you mean by actual syntax. Yeah, we can do that in a sec. Um, so with a remote promise or a handle promise, we can run post on it. And basically that dispatches to the handler that has a post method that gets the re resolved 
value and then the key that you were trying to invoke and the arguments. So um, in this case, we actually return stuff based on another object. Uh, Dean, do you want to share? Yes, I'm tweaking up here. Okay. Let me find my share screen. Okay. So um, the demo is, you know, this is a very simple demo uh, uh, inspired by a thing called the Million Dollar Homepage, where you could you could basically pay for coloring a pixel on a page and it went to charity or something like that. And so people would bid to get interesting pictures to happen. In our system, this is smart contracts on a blockchain. There are individual digital rights to color a pixel. And those are ones rights that you can buy and trade um, or, or make covered calls on or what have you. And so the mechanism, so there is a um, uh, home, which is a local directory. What happens here is I have a REPL here that is uh, the, in my browser, I have a REPL where I'm sending JavaScript. It's run over here in a compartment. That has a remote reference from my playground over to objects in the, oh, I have a different, slightly improved, yeah, there's the million dollar homepage. And from my playground over to an object in the uh, pixel demo, as it's called, which is the gallery or in the gallery of pixels. And so I'm going to execute an expression that sends a message. So I want, there's a thing called a faucet, which is um, a gallery bang tap faucet. And that will return me, faucet, that will return me. I immediately get a promise um, and then it resolved to a remote presence where a presence, this is a familiar term to chip, um, is, is um, uh, if the, uh, the real object is over here that represents the right to change the color of a pixel, the presence is an object over here. You, the, is a, the presence is an object in another VAT. So, so it is, um, you know, here's, here's my reference through the kernel to an, oh no, sorry, wrong picture. Reference through the kernel to an object in another VAT and it's all mediated by a kernel. So uh, notably the presence is the first argument to the resolver. So. When you say for a handled promise, resolve foo comma handler, then foo is that presence as returned. It's just displayed specially because we know presence have a certain format. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. So presence is something that has an associated handler and you can invoke the handler by using the bang syntax on the presence. Well, so conceptually, more simply, so a, a presence represents the local object that is the resolved re reference to a remote object. Um, and, um, and so it's if you did a then on a promise that only has a remote object, if I did a, if, if I did a you know, conceptually, this object is pointing at that, this has a pointer to that object. If I did a then on the promise for that, what I get is a presence running over on the left machine. And so that is implemented by this handler mechanism where it does the promise dot resolve of the presence, gets a promise, and the handler on that promise is the remote reference mechanics. So now um, uh, here, if I do a quick, let me finish my demo just so you can see it. Uh, so I grab, and for historical reasons, I have to split the pixel I got in from transfer into transfer rights and use rights, and then I will change the color uh, of, um, of that, uh, of item 12, and paint it red. And you'll see in the lower right-hand corner, it painted red, right? And if I have you know, and, and if I have a bunch of them, I have a bunch right here that I will paint green. And so that's of course, pipelining messages from one machine to the next and pipelining the results back. 
And since this is all doing stuff by writing in a blockchain, waiting for a block to complete, and then reading the results and cryptographic operations, this is not as fast as one would normally do a distributed object system with, but you get the basic idea. And so uh, in here, right, you can see that I just, you know, home.gallery bang change color. And so we've just got a lot of remote operations that you can do on these things to, you know, similarly, I could go, um, uh, uh, tap faucet, bang, um, I think it's get balance maybe. And that was the balance, which is a balance that says I'm pixel at one dot, one dot two, one at one by two. So that's it, fairly simple. But it means that it's easy to do remote reference stuff, right? I can just do async messages and these were, this was code that was sent to one VAT and then async messages from one machine to another machine. In our particular case, it's from a single machine to replicated execution on a blockchain of machines that are all coming to consensus, but that's sort of the basic idea. You got very soft, whoever's speaking. That's it. Michael, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Back to you. I'm not 100% sure you're using the word presence correctly in my lexicon, but. It is the pass by construction aspect, you know, aspect okay. of the remote okay. object. So the only, it, it, the only it, thing we support is I can send messages to the other side. Right. So in, in principle, it could be, it could manifest as something other that we had a more complicated internal uh, uh, life than simply being uh, essentially a proxy to the remote object. It that's could, right. That's right. Yes. So could. think of it as I've got a proxy to the remote object that, or a promise for the remote object. And I do a then on that. What's the argument? What, what's the result that you, that gets passed into the then, which is something that's always been annoying in, in the, in E and in promise systems. And the answer is it's the presence for that object on this machine. Right. Okay. So, very good. And it has identity. Yeah. So um, when we were speaking about the user and system separation, so the handler is essentially the system side of the remote promise and uh, the presence is the user side where you can get, you can manipulate the presence directly as if it's a regular object. Ah, okay. okay. That, that's, that makes sense. And you don't necessarily have to return the presence when you resolve. You could also resolve to just anything else. And those methods, uh, could you pull up your uh, REPL again, Dean, if you have it? I do. I just need to share it. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, this isn't the new one. Sorry, well, the old oh, one will work. <laughs> oh, OK. Basically, you could do things like uh, uh, double-quoted string, um, bang, brackets, or double-quoted string, bang length. This this works in the in the proper implementation. Uh, oh right, but length doesn't work here. So I right. can do double-quoted string. What is it? Concatenate. What's the what's some, there's I had some operation that I was doing for, that that was a function. Um, yeah, concatenate is probably there's just concat. Concat, right? Um, uh, And that should work. And it of course returns me a promise that then resolves to food up bar and my command line here. I don't know if you could see the flicker of it um, uh, is that it, it, as you can see in some of these other things, it turns into a promise and then turns into the resolve value of the promise. That's just a property of the command line that does a then on the resulting promise. So that's exactly so what happened there. You could also do foo bang concat bar dot then. Uh, and then just return us again. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's the same kind of thing. So just demonstrating that once you hit bang, then you're in the pro world of promises. Mm -hmm. So where this where this matters for each distribution model is uh, you can't do anything that blocks the system when you use bang. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So banging on the system doesn't break it. You're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Hmm. 
lovely. So there are two packages that are useful to know. Um, I'll go briefly into this too for those who are using Realms and SES. The new SES 051 um, has something, it supports something in the Realms shim called transforms. And basically what they are is uh, a way of, let me get the controller. So uh, a transform is basically something that can run on the evaluated strings before they get passed all the way to the evaluator. So the bank transformer, for example, contains a parse method and a generate method. And basically, there's a, a Babel transform that first parses these strings to evaluate and then generates new source strings from it. And that's what's actually passed to the realm to evaluate. Uh, so with the appropriate shims too for the for the extended promise semantics, uh, this is all the code that's necessary to get um, infix bang to be evaluated in your SES root realms. I'm curious a little bit about the. Uh, um Mechanics is perhaps the wrong word, but um, I looked at Babel once upon a time as, oh, here's exactly what we need to, to experiment with infix bang and the way they've packaged it um, strongly inhibits uh, developers from just adding new transformations. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's a way to do that because you did it. Um, uh, yeah, you have to fork their package. <laughs> I see. So you fork so, uh, it and then you, and then you try to get them to accept a pull request? Uh, yeah, and they basically won't accept anything until it's at stage zero in ECMAScript. I see. So once we get there, then we have inertia to get the rest of the people to. The idea is to do that as an ECMAScript proposal, and so by having the implementation and being able to show it off. Now, did you see Kamavis's question in chat? Oh, no. Let me see. Uh, sorry, it's going back a little bit to that uh, the Babel JS.io REPL. Yeah. Um, that example, I, I was just wondering what the, um, the post get put delete are. Okay, I'll show you that. Um, somebody's got some. Where is Babel? So eventual send, there's an agorc uh, repository in GitHub called org slash eventual send. You're echoing some of these news. Yeah. Um, so get put post delete are, uh, I can show you them right here actually. So all that they are is they basically find the handler for the, the current object. That's the resolution of the promise. And then run the get put post delete methods on that handler. So uh, get is automatically transformed from infix bang with a property name or a bracketed computed property. Uh, put is property name equals something. Delete is delete some x bang some key. And uh, post is the function call basically. So it's it's uh, x exclamation mark arguments or x exclamation mark key grand arguments. Uh, so the, the canonical representation for that is down here where we have forwarders. So this forwarding handler basically says, 
if there's if there's a a forwarding if there's a handler for this particular operation on handlers, then use it. Otherwise, fall back to this implementation. So get is the canonical implementation is with O and key. You take the key property of the object. Quit is the key property assigned to value. Delete is just deleting the key. And post is calling either undefined key calls you the function directly or else calls the number. Does that answer this, these, these yeah. will happen after the or the promise you're chaining off of resolves? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I see. Yeah, it's basically give me the result of eventually getting that getting that property is you know x bang open square bracket property name close square bracket. And and, and this is just so, the default implementation, so you can override them in your own handles. Right. So the mechanism for if I if I send multiple um, uh, I'm not quite sure what the right term here now. I think of it as sending messages, but if I do multiple uh, posts, um, um, rather than having a queue, I'm basically sending to a, uh, I, I just, how, how do you get the, uh, 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 when, you, when you have multiple me uh, messages sent to um, an eventual send to the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, how, 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 is, how is that, uh, where, where do they live in the meantime? I mean, if you have a, you have a chain of promises that can function as a cube, but if you're not stacking them in order, is some non-determinism there? Uh, how how does so when you make a handle promise, you you supply the executor, which gets to resolve and reject, and you supply an optional unfulfilled handler, and that's basically until the executor resolves, the unfulfilled handler is used for the the operation. Uh, on it. Okay. So this is this is directly from Mark's Nano Q. Basically, we just changed the API so we can match platform promises more. And so, for example, the flow stuff could almost plug in here, you know. So that can simply implement whatever order you want, right? Right. Right. Yeah. So when you actually resolve, uh, there there is a second argument to the resolver. So you resolve with a target, and that's the thing that's returned as the presence, basically. Right. And if you have a fulfilled handler, then it will map that target to the handler. Okay. And what do you provide as sort of your default unfulfilled handler? The default unfulfilled handler looks like this. Default unfulfilled handler is like this. It's just calling postpone the get, postpone the quit, postpone delete, postpone post. We have an ASIC function that takes those the arguments for that operation and says we wait for the handler to resolve and then we call the forwarded operation on that handler. Ah, uh, okay. So we're, we're so there's a little bit of a queue there, kind of by default. Yeah, but we're, as I said, it's insufficient for actual remote promises because you right pipe on any for that. I think it's reduced to a previously unsolved queue. Right, <laughs> right. We're piggybacking off of async await. Um, um, Okay. Async simply if the forwarded operation returns or throws an exception, then we want to be able to drop that properly. Right. Okay. Thank you for the explanation. That was very helpful. Sure. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, one, one thing, so I, I'm sort of a little further out from the syntax stuff. I'm not that familiar with it. Um, and so this is, you're kind of showing that you're, um, in the Babel example, you're kind of showing that your syntax works or in that your Babel plugin works. Um, but the, if this is not super clear as why I would want this or it doesn't approximate necessarily like a real world example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, that will be my uh, after uh, before Saturday. 
<laughs> yeah. uh, there's a long history a long behind history it. Behind he it. has had this for a long time. time. And um, uh, there is already some information on the JavaScript wiki about this. Uh, that is only on archive.org right now. But, by the way, this code is in eventual send, agoric slash eventual send. Post it here. So my, so Kamavas, my, my example, so we use that syntax for distributed messaging in JavaScript. And so that's the reason, and, and there was a long, long ago proposal when promises were first out to be able to, originally promises were for doing that, that, uh, uh, remote messaging uh, with, with pipelining. And so this is just a matter of, of getting that back into the standard track. That, that URL returns a 404. Oh, really? Agorg.com, I can't type. That would, uh, without the capital H, you can figure it out. <laughs> so it's really good for operations, you know, and, and even doing, you know, web-based operations. It's a much, much nicer syntax for doing invocations, remote queries, remote messages, remote posts. I, 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 I want to get rid of async await. Yeah, we don't actually support async await in the Jesse subset. Yay. <laughs> uh, the other, another motivating example is the REST analog, where you can map those get, put, post, and deletes into actual web transactions, uh, into methods. So right. That's what, uh, it would yeah. be a hand, handy way to interact with a website if you provide your own handler for that. That's, that's essentially what. Uh, Tyler Close did with water can right. Okay, very good. Uh, I have to go. Um, I, I'm I'm losing my uh, meeting room here. Um, but very. Uh, oh, this is awesome. I'm so so thrilled to see this. Great. Um, so I'll get in touch with you, uh, Chip, if you want to give me a shout anytime. That works too. I'm okay. generally free. All right. I'll send you an email just to hook up. Okay. Very good. Great. Uh, we're just a bit over four, so we should probably adjourn now anyway. Okay. See you all later. Um, Michael, uh, yes. one minute or two minutes uh, after the recording just to bounce the idea and see if it bounces or it doesn't, and this way yeah. I can stop it and stop nagging at everyone at no. Absolutely. Let's do it. All right. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. Sure. All right, in case I'm insane. Well, we all need to change. Thanks, all. I'm going to drop out now.